Um, thanks everyone for being here. Welcome. I'm Chris Bavitz from the Berkman Klein Center, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to what I think is our first uh, Tuesday lunch talk of the calendar year 2018. So happy new year, and I uh, hope everyone had a restful winter break. Um, a couple of just sort of administrative notes were being live streamed uh, and recorded for posterity. So when we get to Q&A, which we hope there will be a lot of, we've asked Professor Lobel to save some time to uh, get questions from all of you, just be mindful uh, of that fact. Um, if you're interested in posting, tweeting about this online, we're using hashtag you don't own me, which is the title of Professor Lobel's book that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time introducing Professor Lobel because I want to jump into the, the conversation, but you may know that she is the author of Talent Wants to be Free, Why We Should Learn to Love Leaks, Raids, and Free Riding, previously, and then most recently, and why we're here today, I don't have enough hands for this, but um, You Don't Own Me, which is a, a, a amazing book that has been getting rave reviews as recently as yesterday in The New Yorker, people may have seen that, Wall Street Journal, um, elsewhere. So we're going to be hearing a lot about this story, I think, in the coming weeks and months. And it's a story that some of us who teach about copyright and other things know a bit about, because the dispute about Barbie and Bratz and the IP involved in both of them is a long-running, very contentious dispute. And what we have in this book, I think, is a lot more of the story behind the story, the personal story of, um, of what led to this legal saga. Professor Lobel is a professor at University of San Diego School of Law and alumnus of this institution. And um, I think that's about it for administration. So we're going to go until 1 or 1.15, maybe. We'll save time for Q&A. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Professor Orly Lobel. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So it's such a pleasure to be here. Every time I come back to give a talk at Harvard Law School, I feel completely like a student again, um, which is wonderful because I think um, all of us who went into teaching, uh, we feel like this is what we want to be, uh, lifelong students and lifelong learners. So it's great to be here. And, and really a lot of um, the, the thoughts that I started developing and, and the interest in, in these fields of intellectual property, of employment law and innovation policy started um, in some of my work here. Um, Rebecca Tushnet has been awesome in initiating this talk. Um, and so I'm really grateful for that. Uh, it's, great that people are still coming in and I would totally sit on the floor here so um, <laughs> just you know come close to me if uh, if you don't find a chair um, I, I also just want to mention that tomorrow I am doing an event at the Harvard Coop bookstore at 7 p.m. and it won't be the same as this talk so this is um, we'll focus a little bit more on the IP side and you know kind of the, the law um, courtroom battles, and um, I, I very much would love for everybody who can to come tomorrow, and it'll be a little bit more on the kind of intimate, personal side of um, the personalities, the stories, why, why um, I decided to tell this whole um, saga. But I, I will actually talk about this a little bit um, today, too, um, and, and uh, you can ask me anything you want about it. Um, the story really be begins with an unlikely hero. So there is a designer at Mattel, the world's greatest toy maker, who is really charged, like many of his coworkers, to design every couple of months another dress for Barbie, change her color, the color of her dress, do some makeup. Um, and uh, he, he, Carter Bryant, uh, um, had other dreams. When um, he was young, he um, dreamt of being a fashion designer, and really, this is sort of the second best always for him. Um, and he gets very disillusioned and, I think, frustrated from the corporate culture at Mattel, uh, which leads him to take some, some time off um, to sketch all kinds of things during the, the weekends and nights. The, weekend, the, the term weekends and nights actually becomes a really important part of the litigation. You know, do we own, do you own me? Do you own my weekends and nights? Um, but he also actually takes time off um, 
for a few months and goes away, away from Southern California, away from Mattel, away from kind of the plastic life of um, serving Barbie. And it, he claims that there he comes up with an idea of a different kind of doll, a ratty doll, some, some uh, thing that is more reflective of our contemporary realities, um, uh, it's more empowering for girls, it, um, sassier, multi-ethnic, um, more realistic, really, than the very unrealistic images that, that Barbie has been uh, conveying to, to girls, to women, to uh, boys and, and men uh, for, for five decades. And um, it had create really dominant, so dominant in the market that she, um, by the time Carter Bryant is imagining brats in the beginning of the 21st century, she is, um, she, she has 90% of the market share in the fashion doll industry, in the toy industry. So he sells the idea to a competitor and this is just the very beginning of the story and what happens next is uh, really the, um, a decade long roller coaster of um, courtroom drama and and market drama of um, how these, these companies really battle it out with um, the, the conglomerates that um, have most of the market share and then new entries and, and uh, um, pretty much entrepreneurs, the, the company that develops um, Bratz is a privately held company, MGA, um, and it, started, it, started, it was started by um, a very colorful entrepreneur, Isaac Larian, also in Southern California, an, an immigrant, um, and uh, he he really kind of thinks about it as a David versus Goliath story. But what was amazing is that so many things come out in this um, these two trials really that happened, which is part of what drew me to tell this story because um, it, it goes through one round of trial. Um, basically months and months of testimonies and then um, on appeal it's remanded and then we get um, a different judge, a different team of attorneys on the two sides, a different jury. And one of the things I think that also really emerges from the story is how much these different personalities and characters make a huge difference in the outcome and, and the, um, what comes out in, in the trial. It's also the case that there's a lot of counterclaims um, that are added at, at some point by MGA. And so the story becomes not just about who owns Bratz, but um, who owns a lot of different ideas and knowledge in the market and what is economic espionage and um, what, what can be done in, in uh, fair competition. Um, there's antitrust issues. There, there are a lot of questions about corporate ethics. And all the while, this is all about um, our culture, the culture we create. So I want to step back, though, um, and um, say something about why I became interested in this um, case to begin with. And um, some of you know that I've been studying these questions of knowledge flows, competition, talent mobility, um, and the culture we create in, in a lot of different markets, be it pharma or um, tech or the entertainment industry. How, how do we um, encourage innovation through the, the flow of minds and the engagement and the collaboration um, of the creative and inventive um, people that, that really um, are the experts in these industries? And so, as Chris mentioned, I, I wrote a book about this um, a couple of years ago. Um, and I, I was arguing there that we argue a lot about intellectual property line drawing, as we should. Um, we argue about the, the right exact you know, thresholds we should have in patent law and in copyright law and in trademark. Um, a little bit less so in trade secrets, which I've been uh, writing about a lot. Um, and is a little bit the stepchild of um, intellectual property, but still um, now we have a, f a federal Defend Trade Secret Act and we kind of see 
all of these um, really codes um, of, um, of law and, and we debate about how do we interpret them, what are the right lines that we draw. But I've been arguing that underneath the, the radar we have um, really something that I've called um, the new cognitive property beyond intellectual property that through contracts and through a lot of doctrines that come from elsewhere, mostly employment law, um, but also it's sort of at the intersection of antitrust law and, and contract law and, and uh, fiduciary duties. Um, we, we've been expanding the types of knowledge and the types of behavior that can be controlled by corporations to control and fence ideas, knowledge, information. And I, I've been doing a lot of work on non-compete agreements, in particular before the book. That was um, a little bit my, my focus. Um, and I, I sort of did it around the world. And this is um, in the UN uh, in Vienna, um, where I, I collaborated with um, researchers from all over the world looking at um, the ability of employees to move, the, the um, ability of uh, entry and, and exit, not only in industries but in regions, and um, looking at a lot of correlations with um, between openness and uh, growth, economic growth and innovation, and um, really showing that um, when we have kind of an overfencing, we're subverting the very purposes that are very intuitive in intellectual property debates about promoting um, engagement, exchanges, and progress in arts and sciences. Um, and then, very happily, this happened um, last year, or now it's a, a year and a half ago. In the summer of 2016, I got a call from the White House, which I like saying, I got a call from the White House. Um, uh, but but it, was, it was great. It, um, suddenly, when, when I was writing my first book, when I was writing Talent Wants to Be Free, I said, nobody's talking about this. It's, as I said, underneath the radar. Um, nobody's seeing how non-competes are shaping industries, are shaping um, concentration of industries and preventing entrepreneurship and new entry and, and um, exchanges. Um, and I, I was in California, as, as you know, California does not enforce non-competes. And, and I was looking along with um, a, a groups of uh, other researchers from, from not, not necessarily from law school, from economic departments, uh, a lot of them, um, looking at um, empirical evidence that, that shows that um, California has been really benefiting from, from kind of a lower threshold uh, or, or lower enforcement of these um, constraints. And, but I said, nobody's talking about this. And suddenly, the, the next couple of years, actually, there was a lot of uh, interest and a lot of exposés and, and kind of new um, policy engagement with these questions. And so um, it, was, it was wonderful to give a talk um, uh, at the White House in Washington. I, I was changed all my flights. I was in Berlin on my way to Tel Aviv. I came there to, to Washington. And um, it became part of a working group. It was uh, people from the Treasury Department, um, from um, the President Obama's um, policy team, from the Department of Labor, for the P Department of Justice, and representatives of the states. Um, and and we, we were part of a working group where in October 2016, so this is just before the change in, in the administration, um, it, it all culminated into a president's call for action to the states to um, very much narrow the reach of non-competes in all the different states uh, other than California that has always had uh, uh, an unenforceability of non-competes. And uh, what was very important to me in all of this conversation has always been important to me um, now in, in You Don't Own Me is that it wasn't just posited as uh, this is an employee's rights, this is a labor versus business uh, kind of debate, but really it's about innovation policy and it's about how um, regions grow, how um, uh, entrepreneurship contributes to the health of, of industries. Um, and, and it's, you know, just like with IP, we understand this as um, the way that 
um, we build upon the, the shoulders of giants and, and um, we, um, we progress. So um, I mentioned, you know, Silicon Valley has been kind of the, the prototype uh, um, example of this, of, of a lot of movement um, and um, a lot of a, a startup culture. Um, but it's really been the case that it not only in the tech industry, but I, so I uh, live and work in Southern California. Uh, we call San Diego the biotech beach, where pharma and medical devices and, and, and the biotech industry are thriving. Again, despite the fact that companies cannot uh, sign their talent, their, their insiders on non-competition clauses. And I'll mention also that um, we had similar um, very innovative places like Israel who've been emulating, um, not maybe going all the way to the California model, but being very suspect of, um, of non-compete. Not, again, not uh, as an employee issue, but as an, uh, a way to encourage a startup culture and, and competition. But what I really um, began to, saw, to see, and this is true also in California, perhaps even more so in California, and my story, you don't own me, happens in California, is that the impulse of controlling what you already own, um, be it um, ideas or people, um, you know, human capital um, or intellectual capital, um, is, is very strong and there are a lot of different ways, um, even when they're not called um, non-competes, kind of the, the most blunt instrument of you just can't move to a competitor, there are other ways to try to achieve similar things. And um, so I started thinking about the greater map of um, how we have these two worlds IP that is the more visible one, and as I said, you know, we talk about what is patentable. Uh, the Supreme Court takes, you know, every year basically, you know, cases about, you know, can we patent this uh, kind of technology or not? Uh, a business model, whatever um, the issue of the day is, um, and and with copyright, similarly, can we, you know, copyright the a cheerleading outfit or whatever it is uh, that that they're looking at? But but then. You know, we have on this one side the active debate, and then we have a lot of ways to expand um, the types of ideas and, and knowledge and information that we control through these other tools. And so um, I started looking at um, the expanding language, and empirically this is very strong and very um, just uh, um, intensely um, just visible that uh, employees are signing more and more NDAs, and I'm already kind of planting maybe a, a question in your minds of how does this relate to um, the momentum of Me Too right now, which NDAs play a different kind of role, but actually not so different. I, I've been arguing that it's the same, it's, it's the same coin, kind of different sides of the same coin um, of um, silencing um, speech and also chilling uh, movement and, and invention. Um, so the language that exists in NDAs, the language that exists in assignment clauses, and in, in our story, in um, the uh, MGA versus Mattel, M Mattel versus AMGA um, cases, uh, we, we have Carter Bryant signing a very generic contract that many, many um, of us sign, and increasingly so, in every single industry. And because I've been doing this for a while, I actually not only you know, look at kind of empirical evidence, uh, and there are great um, studies that are underway of counting um, these, these uh, rising numbers, but I also just anecdotally get a lot of emails, you know, I just got an, um, a job with Google, and here's my contract, um, and Google will not negotiate at all this, this contract, but it says, you know, it has this very expansive language of what um, kinds of ideas I'm assigning in the contract. Um, and, and this includes holdover clauses or trailer clauses which go into the future. So um, saying that 
an employee uh, promises to assign all of her his ideas um, or concepts or improvements or designs, you know, not using the the kind of specific legal language of um, of IP. Um, so it's it's a very broad uh, language, and and it's subject to a lot of interpretation. Um, there's the explicit clauses of, and this existed in this case, whether patentable or not patentable, whether copyrightable or non-copyrightable. Um, but it, then it also often says, and even in the year after you leave, or the three years after you leave, any patent that you file belongs to us, or you know, any idea. So again, you can think about it as creating de facto non-competes um, post-employment that really uh, make it very difficult to um, to, to look sideways whether you're founding your own company or moving to a competitor. And so one of the things that is, I think, very um, clear in intellectual property and in, in sort of the, the traditional pillars of intellectual property is that even though we're in the world of intangible assets, we still have a spectrum of intangibility. Um, what do I mean by that? So in patent law, we have um, sort of very, it, it's not that it's clear lines, line drawing in the sense that we don't argue in the margins of, you know, uh, how do we exactly draw these lines, but we have very um, clear statements already in the act that we, um, we, we can protect something that was reduced to practice, but not something that's so abstract that um, is, is, is unpatentable. And very similarly in copyright, in the act it says we're protecting expressions but not ideas. Um, so we have that, uh, that line drawing. We also have it in trade secrets um, in law traditionally and, and, and always in, uh, over the years, although again, we see this as very problematically um, um, challenged by, by actual cases. Um, we have that line drawing between um, general skills and know-how and what is really secret and um, special skill, special uh, knowledge that, that can be deemed trade secret. And we see this, I'll, I'll just mention, um, if you've been following the Uber versus Waymo case, uh, I've written a, a little thing about it recently in uh, the Harvard Business Review. Um, the, the judge just, I think a few weeks ago, said, he was asking the, um, the two sides, um, you're not really suggesting that an employee who moves from one company to a competitor needs to undergo a lobotomy, all right? Uh, it's like, that's right, really, isn't that the law? Well, yes, that's the law, but that's not the way that sides often tend to argue about what employees can or cannot do. And um, it's actually been a, a, a point of um, disappointment and argument um, with the Defend Trade Secret Act that was passed um, in 2016 that it was an opportunity actually to clarify that distinction because again um, trade secret law um, is yes it's a pillar of intellectual property but it's also very much um, an employment relationship uh, moderator in, in, in the sense that 90 percent actually of all um, cases in, in, in that, that actually involve trade secrets um, have a, a plaintiff and a, a, a defendant that are, were connected in some way, usually in an employment relationship. Usually it's a former employee and, and a, an employer. It's not what we think of as like, you know, the traditional spying of, um, you know, somebody taking a helicopter like the DuPont case and, and looking over um, a plant. That's, that, those are the rare cases. Um, so, so with the Defend Trade Secret Act, I actually was part of a, um, a professor's um, letter of opposition uh, to, to Congress when there, we were thinking about the language of the, the act to say that it was a moment that could clarify those distinctions or, or um, it could state them more clearly uh, because uh, they, they are constantly kind of uh, in question. Um, but uh, that, that was not done. Um, but uh, what, what all of these suggest is that in these, uh, all of these pillars of IP, um, we have leakage and we have 
um, limits that are really a feature and not a bug in, in these systems. That's the bargain of intellectual property. Anybody who studies it is just like the basics that, that we um, all know. But um, we're forgetting uh, this a lot of times when we see um, these, these contract interpretation cases um, that, that are very prominent. Um, so for example, in Carter Bryant's contract, there was language that said know-how which we know that, that said, you know, all know-how belongs to Mattel, which we know, because I just said, <laughs> but also maybe, maybe um, you know, when, if you study trade secrets, but it's, that's not part of what, uh, you know, uh, trade secret without, absent a contract would define as owned by a company. It also, the contract said that anything that was conceived while working at Mattel, so um, kind of, the, there's that musing by the court. So conceived can mean something that completely stays in your mind and hasn't come out to that uh, reduced to practice or a, a concrete expression. It's, it's completely still abstract. It's not in uh, any kind of tangible form that's still required. And I think one of the fascinating moments of this case is when um, it comes up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, after there's a huge win, an astonishing win for Mattel, um, having argued that just because the seed of an idea of a very successful um, new doll line and a new empire, a billion dollar um, empire founded by or, or started by a smaller competitor after years of dominance and, and no competitors, uh, as the court says, uh, knocks Barbie off the, her pedestal and for the first time there, there's competition, because that seed started in the mind of a former employee, uh, in the first round, really, uh, the court says that the entire empire of the brass doll line, including you know, all the copyright, the, the trademark, the, the word brass, everything, it belongs to Mattel, and uh, that the, the brass, or MGA has to stop any production of that, um, of that doll line. And what becomes really interesting in, when um, it goes up on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, there's a lot of different things that um, you have to read the book to, to understand the dynamic. There's, uh, there, there are claims about uh, racism in the, among the jurors and, and all kinds of uh, questions about um, the kinds of information that, or the kinds of um, aspects that were allowed to, to be presented during the, the first trial. But on these uh, specific questions, or in the most substantive, you know, important questions, uh, Judge Kaczynski, you know, former Judge Kaczynski, um, he sits and, and, you know, there, there's a lot in, in the book about Judge Kaczynski, and, and you can ask me about this, but, but, um, but I sat down with him um, a couple of times to ask him about his worldview on intellectual property, on, on speech, and, and, um, and there's some anecdotes there. But uh, I think that you know, his brilliance in intellectual property juris, uh, uh, jurisprudence is really um, not contested, and, and he's, he's been um, a very important voice there. And, um, but, but what is really amazing there is that he says, it's like there's two Judge Kaczynskis. Um, he says, well, when we're looking at the copyright issue, if we're just talking about copyright that was owned by Mattel by virtue of the fact that um, Carter Bryant was um, work for hire, so just kind of on the, the pure copyright act um, stands or law, we have, we have very strong limits on what copyright can get you. And they say MGA, or Judge uh, Kaczynski says MGA was free to say, oh, an idea of a bratty doll. That's great. We'll just develop an, that idea. Um, and he says it's just like Stephanie Meyer was free to invent or to create the Twilight series, even though you know sexy vampires existed in in all kinds of books. Um, you know Dracula um, is one of them. Um, he says it's just like Degas 
you know, painted ballerinas, but a lot of people, a lot of artists after that can be free to say, oh, um, wonderful idea to, to, paint, uh, to paint dancers and, and only the concrete expression is protected. But then there's that split. He says, then he sort of moves, and it, it, it's not that he connects the two. It's, it's me talking about the two Kaczynskis. Because then he sort of moves on and says, OK, now we're, we're going to the contract. And suddenly he says, oh, it's all about contract interpretation. We have to figure out whether the word conceived meant that everything that's in his head and, and um, you know, that's, that's possible, whether when it says, um, while you're working at Mattel, it means also any time that you're away from Mattel also, um, even if you came with ideas before to Mattel, and that's, there's, there's these really um, striking moments in the uh, second trial where there's a very sophisticated and, and smart um, attorney that kind of shifts the discourse, but she says to the CEO of Mattel, so let's say I'm 18 and I have this great idea for a startup or invention or, or a design, and I put it in the drawers of my parents' bedroom or my parents' house. And then I, you know, 20 years later, I'm now started a job with a, an employer. I go back home during Christmas. I take the, the sketches out. Do you own the, these sketches? And uh, Bob Eckert says, sits there <laughs> and, and says very coldly, Yes, very probably yes. And that really kind of, I think using that really extreme example um, shifts a lot of the dynamic with the jury and the perceptions of, of what we're talking about here. But, but Judge Kaczynski seems sort of um, not very, uh, he, he gets very um, worried about over-controlling uh, culture through intellectual property repeatedly in all of his cases. Um, and he's not worried on, on that contract side. So I, I think I'll end very um, soon here, but I'll just say two more things. That um, we're talking about the cost, again, not just um, to uh, these employees that can't move on, but it's the cost to entrepreneurship and to a, a startup culture. What we've seen in the empirical studies is that um, these kinds of controls don't only chill the likelihood of actually moving or actually developing something if you have um, these uh, you know, competitive ideas. Um, but it also patterns when people move, if they actually move, there's, there's suppression of that mobility, but when they actually move, they are much more likely to move, like in this case, to uh, another competitor that can indemnify them, can protect them, can represent them. And really, Carter Bryant, you have to read the story, but he's like, this pawn, this little bug that's sort of crushed by all sides, and he, his voice really kind of disappears. Um, he's, I, I started out saying he's the hero of the story, but he's just the beginning of the hero. And then it's sort of like a, a Greek tragedy where like the, the father of rats is, um, is written off, uh, has to die in order for, for um, everything else to, to happen. Um, so he doesn't die literally, but he does get a, a no, it's a sad story. He does get a heart attack uh, in the middle of the trail. He goes through these, he, he goes away from the, the, the industry. It's just, um, it, there's a, a story there about individuals and corporations and, and concentration of, of competition. Um, so I will end there and say um, I... I uh, would love to get your questions. This is from the Financial Times. And we can talk about everything from dolls, consumer psychology, and a lot of other things that um, are in the book. Thank you. <laughs> Test. Right. It's it's well, but that's every year you think that yes. <laughs> you said this got remanded and reversed. What was why did that happen, and what was different the second time around? Yeah. Um, so Kaczynski found 
or it was a, an uh, unanimous decision by the, the Ninth Circuit, um, found um, several problems with the, the, um, the lower court guidance to the jury. Um, and, but, but a lot of them were sort of, you didn't understand that there were um, these lines to be understood. So, so, you know, I said before that he understood the contract to be subject to interpretation, but he said, well, let's, let's see what the two sides intended when they said conceived. Can it also embody ideas? And let's remand it on that. Um, let's, say what, let's see what the two sides intended when they said um, everything that you did while you were working, did it also mean when you were at home with your partner at night or you know, during the weekend? Um, so he, he sort of said, well, the, the, the first court just said, here's the contract. He's a, star, he's a standard, standard contract. He was a former employee and didn't even go into these questions. And he um, sort of um, complicates it by saying, maybe the two sides didn't try to capture everything. But again, this is my critique there that um, I think he's sort of almost guiding the next companies of writing an even more expansive contract on those fronts. And then the, 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 the other issue that um, he, he saw as a mistake by the lower court was that um, it's, it's all about unjust enrichment, where he says, even if it's true that um, MGA unlawfully took something that belonged to Mattel through that um, you know, uh, contract that they then had with, with Carter Bryant, um, the, the, the lower court didn't even look at all their investment in the Brath Empire and how can it be that even if there's you know, something that belonged to Mattel, um, the entire empire now is, is really transferred from one competitor to the next. And again, th this, is, this will really be very important in like, the automated cars uh, questions right now with Vima. Well, you have to read the book, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's a huge reversal. One, one attorney that I interviewed for the book um, said that it was the biggest reversal of fortune that he's ever seen. He's a very prominent you know, decades of litigation that he's ever seen because it's not, I'll tell you that it's not only that the second um, judge and, and jury were you know, completely um, unsold on all of the arguments that were presented by Mattel and different uh, understanding of what Carter owed, owed uh, Mattel and how the contract uh, confined him. But also, there were counterclaims that resulted in um, huge losses at t for, for counterclaims about economic espionage, about antitrust um, violations, that it became like almost a mirror image of the first trial. Yeah. Hi. I'm Kathy. I found this talk so very interesting because of the content, but also just personally interesting. I've spent a lot of my time um, in tech and then in the government, but also with side gigs on the side and constantly talking to our general counsel at different points of like, is this okay to work on? Um, and hoping I don't somehow end up in a situation like this. Um, I have a two-part question. First part is your lobotomy example really strikes me. And so at what point do you really know, because companies have recruiters who source candidates from other companies, right? right. And they, you hire people because they know how the other company works and you bring them in. And it's everything from, oh, inside Google, they have free food and bean bags. So now we're going to copy free food and bean bags. Is that okay? Um, yes, to, that's okay. <laughs> to um, this is how self-driving cars work, and then right, we're going to move right. that over. Um, and so like, how do you really know it's okay and that the related part is, are there resources for, or what are some of the good resources for people to look to, just individual employees? Because going to the company's general counsel isn't really in your favor. So what are reliable resources people can really look to to understand what's okay and what's not, if you just don't have a bunch of lawyer friends or people to reach out to? Right. That's, that's a terrific question because um, the sort of flip side of, of this question is when you don't know, what do you do? And when you don't know, what you do is sort of over, you become overly cautious, right? You either don't leave or you don't speak or you don't, um, you don't even you know, straddle those lines. Um, and, and, and you're right that most people don't have um, 
legal counsel. It's, uh, it's been shown now with uh, a bunch of empirical studies that even in California where like non-competes, that's a really hard line and that, and I like that hard line because it doesn't make you try to figure out those much you know, more difficult fine-tuned lines. Um, but even then, um, there's a lot of misinformation and, and there's um, overreaching where even California companies ask employees to sign on competes and most of them don't even figure out that they can't, um, that, that it's not enforceable, that it's void. And even when they figure it out, they are risk averse. And, and uh, some of the things that you know, we see in, in the research and, and I think in, the, in, in this um, story, it, it comes out too that um, even if you win, eventually win uh, in the courtroom, you know, eventually, eventually, eventually what happens, um, one of the clear things that happened is that in this case, it was $600 million of legal fees in, in the aggregate. So who can it sustain those? Uh, I, have, I have a lot of um, stories in the book about these smaller artists that are doing things that they can do, but it's only the few cases that are actually picked up by the ACLU or you know, some, some kind of um, cause litigation um, or by this bold competitor like MGA where Isaac Larian's personality was just like, I'm gonna fight it, I, I almost think that it's dumb and my wife is telling me it's dumb, but I'm gonna fight it till the end. But to get back to your question of how do you draw the line um, kind of personally, so I think there's probably some things that are really difficult in the, um, you know, exactly kind of in the middle, but a lot of the things are very obviously not, um, not owned by a company. So um, just like you mentioned, you know, the, the, um, the ideas about free food in a cafeteria and, and you know, having a, a nice design and you know, comfortable um, living area in, in, in workplaces, that certainly, I, there's, I just don't see any um, cause of action or any court that would accept that as being some kind of infringement upon um, the property, the, the, the intellectual assets, the ideas of, of uh, a company and that's why that's why I think that um, we should be more clear that what the lines that we've drawn in intellectual property that are so important of saying things that are general knowledge, things that are, don't um, you know, just fall into the patent, um, copyright, trade secret definitions should not be expanded by contract. That that's, and, and there's, some, you know, there's some codes that try to do that, but I think that they don't do it uh, well enough. There's a dozen states, unlike the non-compete issue, which um, it's only California 16600 that really very clearly voids non-competes. We actually have a dozen states, including California, that have codes about um, how you, uh, the court has to void contracts that try to um, go into um, or to, to assign um, patents, usually is the, the um, language. Um, of things that happened completely off the job or didn't use any trade secrets or materials um, of the employer. But um, I think those, those are sort of sleeping giants that need to be fleshed out more. There's over here. There's Hi, this is fascinating, um, and even more so because I recently saw Raj Chetty um, speaking at Brookings about the connection between creativity and inequality. Yeah. So the idea that we're kind of really losing out because our creative, you know, possibilities are just being trumped on in so many different ways. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah. So and I, I have. Um, um, thank you for that question because I have a lot of different thoughts um, that um, link up to that question of inequality. I and mean, one thing is that I mentioned, you know, market concentration. Uh, the toy industry is very representative. It's we're talking about um, basically a duopoly between Mattel and Hasbro for years and years that have shaped 
I think, such important aspects of our lives. So, you know, I, I chose to write this book um, to show that I think we have um, more of these conversations about um, who controls different markets when we're talking about the financial markets, maybe in New York, Wall Street, and then uh, in Silicon Valley, you know, if, if you've seen um, the social network and kind of the invention of Facebook, we have kind of a similar seed of the idea and in, a, in an employment relationship, uh, allegedly. Um, and, um, and I wanted to bring it to the toy and entertainment industry because I think we should really take um, culture very seriously, not just sort of the, the products uh, the, the, or the tech um, that, you know, who, who develops the iPhone and automated cars, which is, of course, so important, but also, you know, who controls images. And, and these are images, these are iconic images of womanhood, um, of childhood. These are decisions that parents do or make all the time. And Mattel has these astounding statistics about how every American girl um, owns, um, on average, nine Barbies, and um, how um, it's just like you know a Barbie doll is, is bought every second. Um, and I, I, in the book, I reveal um, how I was raised by um, a mother who's a psychologist and, and um, is a uh, a uh, professor who studies um, gender development and, and child, in child development. And I was sort of inadvertently a, a, an early critic of the toy industry because she filmed me playing with boy toys and girl toys and, and showed it around the world. And, and there are a lot of lessons um, about how we're perceived by others. And, and so I started taking play really seriously from an early age. So, Inequality also means that you know, we have more choices in um, the images that are put out there, the, um, the play that we can um, uh, have in the iconic you know, characters that, that exist, and you know, who controls the message, um, uh, who puts out you know, the, the, the kind of connection between the retail industry and, and the uh, manufacturing industry. Um, there, there's a, a very interesting history in the book about Mattel's um, kind of one step forward, two steps back with um, diversity in their dolls. You know, when did they introduce an African American doll? How do they market that? Um, they, um, there's, there's a lot of problems there. Um, and then kind of the bigger picture, and um, this is, might, might be the, the um, part of the lecture that you just listened to, was, is that we have more and more studies that show that in more equal societies, we actually have more innovation and, and, and more creativity. And, and that's not surprising at all to me when, when you know, I'm, I'm looking at how um, there's not just that chilling effect of employees being afraid of moving to, even when they're unhappy, when they're discontent. Um, I have some experimental studies with, um, with behavioral economists that we published a, a few years ago where we show that motivation and performance really goes down when you're stripped from your human capital and you can't actively use it and you can't imagine managing your career trajectory and, and, and you have to sort of stay where your, your talent is not put to the best use and, and is not the best fit and, and, and the employer is not using carrots but rather than stick, but rather they're using sticks to, um, to keep you there. Um, that's, that's a real cost. Um, there's also studies about how um, lack of mobility or, or depression of mobility leads to wage depression because there's less of a tournament you know, over the best talent and you can't renegotiate your salary, you can't improve your, your position by, by job hopping. Um, but beyond all of that, just that openness, just the, the culture of um, being able to exchange, to, 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 to create um, and, and to pursue your passions, I think that is, is clearly linked to a society that's, you know, that, that has more equality in it. 
I'm going to exercise the moderator's prerogative and throw a question in. And so, um, and it picks up on maybe, I think some things Kathy was talking about, about the culture of people who do one job while always working on 11 things on the side. Right. And some of us here work in our tech clinic here at the law school now, and a very common fact pattern for us that we see all the time from clients is the person who is a software development somewhere, but is working on some public interest open source software project on right. the side. And we're starting to see some recognition from companies that the provisions in these non-competes competes technically hinder that, right? These, these people come and are ostensibly releasing their code into this open source software development project under the terms of some you know, off-the-shelf open source license, perhaps making reps and warranties they really aren't supposed to be making because it would violate this, this non-compete. And we're starting to see companies recognize that there are these contributor license agreement types of arrangements, some of which require sign-off by employers. And I'm seeing some, at least some of the employers recognize that this is something they have to do because I'm, I'm assuming for market reasons, right? They want this talent. They want the kind of person who's going to work nine till five on their product and then go home work five till nine on their own product because these are the, the brilliant engineers. But um, it's clunky. It's not it's still not perfect, but I'm wondering if there are lessons for other creative industries from software where, again, I think there's a culture of just coders code and they code for a living and they code in their free time and they work on public interest projects and they work on for-profit projects. Um, I don't know if you've seen, if you have any yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I think that's, that, that is happening and I think that in general and, and um, in every industry there are examples of um, the, the most desirable and then because of that, the, the employees that have the most bargaining power um, do have some level of sophistication about how these contracts can sign them. They can negotiate them. And, and the best, I, I always think that the best industry leaders are actually open to that. So we have examples, including in Massachusetts. You mentioned that Massachusetts every year has um, that bill on the table that at first wanted to completely emulate California and voiding non-competes. Um, and then sort of struck some bargain, which still didn't pass, about having you know, strong limits on non-competes and, and really re requiring trade secrets to be behind them and things like that, um, and, and we'll see. But, but in Massachusetts, there are, um, I got several companies calling me up and saying, you know what, we want to show our employees, as part of our recruitment process, or as part of our brand, our reputation, that we will allow, we want to keep them because they're happy. We're going to incentivize them in the right ways. And we actually think that we're benefiting from them having a lot of these side projects. Um, Richard Branson um, has that uh, idea at Virgin that's sort of like corporate venture capitalism where he's like, you know, my best talent is not going to stay here. I'm going to actually invest in your you know, next stages and I'm going to let you, you know, play in your free time. I mean, Google has this idea of playing with the 20%, but while owning it. So that's, that's been kind of problematic um, in, in various ways. But it's, it also shows an understanding that you know, that's that kind of independence that we need from creative minds. There are other things at play. So um, there, uh, you alluded to this, that a lot of, a lot of uh, ways that we work these days is not that kind of idea of uh, full-time, one employer, lifetime security model. And with that, you know, comes the question of what do we get in return? And, you know, is it a new psychological contract and a new legal contract where it actually means that we own more of our human capital and should have the right to, um, to use um, the, the network, the, the experience that we gained um, elsewhere, that, you know, it, it should actually mean more of that. But of course, we see the reverse. We see because there's sort of more contingency in work, there's a lot of um, a, a lot of different attempts and a rise of attempts um, of creative attempts to to stop that. Um, but I think that there sometimes there are, there are things that kind of challenge that. So, for example, Uber and Lyft are an example where because they care about sort of another area of law, which is employee classification, driver classification as independent contractors, they've been very clear about in their contracts that you can totally go and work for Lyft while you're working for Uber. Um, they, they're very explicit about it because just, you know, kind of in cost-benefit analysis, they think this, this is what they care about more. It's sort of an infinite pool. It's the reverse problem of an infinite pool of drivers almost. Um, that, and, and so 
you, you're signaling that you allow competition. Um, and one more thing about the, the software culture. Yes, a lot of people acknowledge that you know, programmers want to do the open source and, and that's you know, part of their um, persona and, and, and um, activity. But I also um, have looked very closely at the um, Sergey Alenikov case, if you know this. Um, uh, and again, the Goldman Sachs uh, programmer that the day he leaves Goldman Sachs is not only um, you know, uh, accused of, of, of taking some code that he um, had, had programmed. Um, so this is not a civil, this is not like you don't owe me a, a you know, uh, civil litigation. He's actually arrested by the FBI and sentenced to eight years of prison. Um, and during the trial, his attorney takes these two, um, just like two sets of code side by side and shows it to the jury. Here's Goldman Sachs. Here's the one that's from the open source. They're identical except the one from Goldman Sachs has confidential property of Goldman Sachs. Um, and that didn't help him much. Um, and you know, Michael Lewis did a big expose on the, uh, on the Alenikov case in Flash Boys. And um, I think you know, a lot of just experts in the um, high frequency trading um, industry understand that that code was exactly what you described, sort of like open source. And, and still, this is, again, it's not even just about money. It's about your liberties and, and, and sentencing. And, and trade secrecy um, has really moved a step up with um, a lot of uh, prosecutorial activities. I wrote um, an article about this with um, my co-author, Rochelle Dreyfus, who's at NYU, and we really kind of mined through this. So, um, you know, there's, there's examples on both sides, but when somebody hears about that case, they get very, very worried about what they can do. <laughs> yeah. That's we're going to save a couple minutes at the end because this is a book talk. We actually have books, so we'll mm -hmm. save a few minutes at the end for that. Hi. So if, if so many of the problems in this area are coming essentially from private law, from these assignment agreements or NDAs or something, where, where do we look for to see the solution? Is it in right. court's interpretation of the agreements, you know, avoiding them for unconscionability, something like that, or is it going to take either federal or state legislative action? Right. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I don't think it's a choice. You have to make a choice between the two. Um, so I think as long as we have the laws that we have right now, there are ways through court interpretation. This is, again, why I think that this case is so fascinating that you can see the same exact facts, the same exact contract, and going completely different ways with a, a better judge, you know, better guidance from, from the Court of Appeals on you know, how to instruct the jury and you get different, just a different line drawing. Um, but I still think that, and it goes back to your question of you know, how do you know when, when it's uh, really fuzzy, I still think that um, things like uh, the, the non-compete voidance, the, you know, the, the business code that we have in California is really important. And that's why I said with regards to uh, trade secrets, it would have been good to have that in the Defend Trade Secret um, Act. Uh, you know, clear dis distinctions and, and um, clear language about how the knowledge and general skills that employees have are not. We have it in the Uniform Trade Secret Act. We have it sort of in the restatements, but it would have been better to educate um, judges on this um, in, in clearer ways. And, um, and, I, and I think that there, in, in all of these other pillars, it would be good to have these kinds of amendments and, and statutes. And, 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 and so one example is right now there are, there's a, a bill before Congress that, that is called the Me Too bill. Um, and, um, and at least three states, I think New York, Pennsylvania, and California have similar bills that would void um, secrecy in um, NDA clauses when it has to do with harassment. Um, again, that's, that's an area where it's um, already we have ways in the law and in the, in the doctrines to already get to a lot of the result without passing these laws. But I think um, 
statutes have you know a stronger effect in, in um, educated employees, educating uh, judges and employers. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.